Good morning. This is the Blaine Toro podcast that can be found each week on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. You can also listen in on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And you can get more information and see past shows at our website, www.blainesworld.net. I'm your host, Blaine Greenfield, and I'm here in my lovely studio in downtown Fairview, North Carolina. Each week, we focus on positive news and information about both people and organizations in West North Carolina and throughout the country. And toward that end, it's my pleasure to introduce a new friend of mine, and he is Jack Lunn. And Jack, you can wave to all your friends and friends who are watching this. Okay, and that's Jack Lunn. And Jack, as you're going to see, is kind of an interesting guy who does a little bit of everything. Um, <laughs> and in particular, I've got to know, know Jack through his work with Asheville Score. And we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But Jack, the question I always ask people when I meet them for the first time is, as a kid, you grew up where? Grew up in a tiny little town in West Tennessee, Henning, Tennessee, H-E-N-N-I-N-G. Okay. Population 615 when I was there. Okay. And then when you left, it was 614, right? So. That's right. Okay. And it's still a little town? Yes, it is. And it's, I went there to visit a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago, a week ago. It is a true ghost town now. It is depressing. And I hate to say that, but it is. Uh well, our one bright shining spot there is the Alex Haley Museum. Are you familiar with Alex sure. Haley? I take yeah. it. Wrote Roots. Well, Alex Haley is from Henning, and they've got a beautiful museum and a uh, big center there. And I finally took a tour of that. I'd been by his house a million times, but that is the bright and shining spot of Henning. The rest of it is depressing ghost town. My house looks like... <laughs> Looks like third world country, man. Nobody lives there. It's just, a, it's terrible. Oh, so you have, but you have still there? Barely. Barely. But, you know, it's sad because, you know, you see a city. So when you were a kid, though, 615, was there a vibrant town or was there stuff yes, in there? Yes, it was. I mean, very much so. It was a, and it was just, a, I wouldn't swap growing up there for anything. It was just a tiny little country town in West Tennessee, about 50 miles north of Memphis, it's in Lauderdale County. It's it butts up to the Mississippi River. So it is some of the best farmland in the United States, and particularly cotton and soybeans is the two primary crops there. So I grew up there. Henning had all these little country stores downtown. We had two sawmills. Uh, that was kind of our industry. I think that was about it, other than little retail. You know, it, one of my favorite little retail stores I used to use in a set was uh, Hamel's Dry Goods and Fancy Foods. <laughs> I and that. I always wonder what what's the fancy food. I think that's sauce, which okay. is country okay. ass food. Of, you know, was that still there? No, it's. I mean, if I had pictures to show here, it's all everything's boarded up. It's like tumbleweeds rolling uh, down the shame. street. Did they have a high school there? No, we didn't. We're too small. I went I to Ripley say, High School. So anyway, so Jack. You got out of that area, and let, let's kind of fast forward a little bit to the rest of your life. So you, you left that area, and you moved. Eventually, you got into sale, a sales career. You were telling me, is that primarily right. your background in sales? It is my background. I've been in sales approximately about forty years. Prior to that, more so just kind of a marketing job. Uh, got a BA from the University of Memphis, is called Memphis State back then. Later went back, got an MBA in marketing. I've actually taught marketing courses as adjunct faculty at University of Memphis. Um, so my background is is that, but primarily in sales in two different areas. One, about 20 plus years in media sales, radio, TV, newspaper. Uh, the other is in packaging sales. I did about half, half my career in that. And that's what I ended up doing was the packaging stuff. And what I found fascinating about you, Jack, the first time I met you, is we didn't so much talk about your sales career, but as you were doing this, you also got into, I guess, side career or side gig as a comedian, or you do comedy as well. Correct. How'd you get, how'd you get into that? Well, <laughs> man, I always love to make people laugh. Okay, it's just kind of my DNA. My father was a funny man, not a professional comedian, but he loved the stage of whatever it might come his way. My mother loved to laugh. She had to, to live with my daddy. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so... I grew up with that. It's it's in my DNA. Uh, I never set out to be some comedian, okay? Uh, people just found me funny. And I didn't really know that, but, you know, 
coming along my senior in high school, they voted me most humorous. And I always uh, use a little joke, you know, I was voted most humorous my senior year in high school. I think it's just a kind way of saying least likely to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> you, and so you, we go from there. You were lucky, though, Jack, in that my brother's claim to fame was that in high school, um, he was voted the third cutest boy's wiggle, you know. And my, my mother wasn't thrilled with that. You know, she wanted him to be most likely to succeed, whatever. But third cutest men's wiggle, boy's wiggle, that was his claim to fame. But you were the, the most humorous, pretty cool. And what did that mean to you? Did that give you ideas or did that give you ideas you wanted to go on with comedy? No, not really. Not at that <laughs> point. I just kept being me, you know. But somewhere along the line, I I had a hankering to kind of get out and do some comedy. So I took a stand-up class. I, and I forget where I was. Uh, I'm a lifelong Tennessean, by the way. I live in Asheville now full time. But uh, it was in Nashville. OK, probably it's 20 plus years ago. So I, comedy had been has been kind of a side hustle, if you will. I was pretty successful in sales and I didn't want to quit that to go full time comedy. But somewhere along the lines, I got, you know, did a stand up class. And then I stopped, looked around and uh, Toastmasters was out there. I said, well, that'd be a good place to kind of get your skills up, you know, in front of people. And so I started doing that and, you know, humor, humor speeches. I won a humor speech contest and kind of moved up that a little bit. But Toastmasters was not the format for me. That was just, I, I am not, I'm not Andrew Dice Clay, but I'm not churchy clean either. I'm not <laughs> this Reader's Digest, you know, churchy stuff. Not that Toastmasters is, it's a great organization. I just, I've got an edge about me and I just have to, it's more the comedy routine. So anyway, so I started in doing that and man, just work. I've done open mics, uh, gigs all over the country work. I got to semi pro level, I'd say. And I'd say for me, you could compare me to baseball. Be like, I'm like, a, I was like a double A guy. I wasn't major league, but I opened for some national acts. I was paid. I opened for Gallagher. I opened for Emo okay. Phillips. Got him, uh, Jeff Allen, who's a, a famous Christian comedian. I was on this, the short list at Zany's in Nashville for local comics. So they'd had me up there on a regular basis. And Nashville's pretty, pretty yeah. as, a, as you might imagine, pretty good or uh, entertainment town. So there was some good, there's some funny folks coming out of Nashville as well. So I was in that arena mixing it up. Do you remember your first paid gig? Uh, let's see. Let's see. You know what I think it was, was uh, I did. And I've done these characters. I'll create these characters. <laughs> I was, I worked for the Tennessean in Nashville for Gannett. Okay. Right. And we were always doing these skits and I ended up, my mind just would ramp up and do these different things. And, I got to be pretty funny at it. Next thing you know, somebody refers me to a psychiatrist. Not, <laughs> not that I needed it, but I probably did. Anyway, end up hooking up with that guy. And he was specialized in ADD and ADHD. He needed somebody to entertain his convention. Well, one thing led to another. I ended up being that guy. And I was kind of proud of the bit I did is that I created this character that had that was a professional in ADD, but he didn't realize that he had it himself. <laughs> Great and so I built this whole routine around that. I got paid for that. So it was, it kind of, that was kind of maybe my first paid gig. Well, I'm a little disappointed because looking at you, uh, I don't see the framed check in the back. You know, I, I thought we'd have that or. It'd be, well, it, <laughs> you know, I found, it was kind of funny. I actually made, now this is from a set. I saved one time. I used to sell bumper stickers, you know, at my, comedy shows and i saved the first dollar i ever made from mm -hmm. that i still got it what, what was the bumper sticker well it's kind of a long long it it tied into my my closure of my set and the bumper sticker is this little douche coop <laughs> d-o-u-c-h-e little douche coop you had to be there, but anyway, <laughs> my closer in my set, and I'll just tell you, I mean, I won't tell you the, the, the bit, but <laughs> I kind of close with, uh, uh, you know, hey, has anybody had any crazy jobs out there? Crazy job. Yeah, yeah, and I'll kind of, you know, work the crowd that way. And, and then I'll let it die down. I said, well, 
I sold douche for a living, <laughs> which I did. I sold Massengill for three years. I built a set around that and I have a punchline in there. But anyway, it's the little douche coupe was the bumper sticker that kind of brought it all together. And they sold pretty good, actually. I, I love it, but it's a fun thing to, you know, say that you saw this guy, um, Jack Lunn. So you then started doing comedy. You were still working full time and you're doing this. Yeah, in, in, I always different... have been. I always have. And I just, like I said, Blaine, um, man, I've learned that if you're going to be a stand up comedian, you got to quit your job and go on the road and do it for about 10 years and then stick your head up and say, okay, how am I doing it? <laughs> and the reason being is that it is, it's a tough, it's fun, but it's a lot of work and it's a tough gig. And, you know, I'm competing against pros to get airtime and I may get, you know, one set a week for five minutes or whatever. And they're doing four shows a weekend. And it's all about building your minutes and getting, it's just like hitting a baseball. You've got to get the reps in. Again, I was a pretty successful sales guy. I wasn't, I didn't want to do that. My wife didn't want that like kind of lifestyle. So I didn't go the stand-up comedy route, but I still enjoyed doing the comedy. Okay. So that's yeah, kind yeah. of where, you know, that's that's where you that's where you end up as double A. And, okay. and I was an opener. Here's here's the thing, excuse me, Blaine, to be high level, you gotta have about an hour, hour and a half of A plus material. I had about 30 minutes of a plus material now you know i'm not i had a lot of material but you got to bring the a game for people to pay to come see you well well your point's well taken because it reminds me of when i saw seinfeld in uh asheville several years ago and it was the most incredible thing jack like you said two hours straight and without notes and you could just go straight and it sounded you know original it sounded real and that's pretty a game stuff you know to uh, totally he's know. the he's the yeah, yeah. go ahead no, no, but I'm saying, but he he's so phenomenal. Compare, contrast that to, no offense to Cosby, but I saw Cosby a couple of years ago in Asheville, and all he was doing was recycling his old stuff. You know, he took it from his children, made them his grandchildren. <laughs> you know, it wasn't new. It wasn't original. It wasn't fresh. And you could see the difference, you know, but at one time it might have worked. But go back to something you were saying. So in terms of working that material, did you also uh, do the whole thing where you had to do a comedy show and you only got paid if you brought in audiences or did you ever have to do that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. That, a lot of open mics. They, they, they hook it that way. And that's yeah. fine. What you had to get people to pay to, to come in to pay to see you. <laughs> that's kind of harsh way of putting it, but yeah. Yeah. You, they would. Yeah. Some of that, but you go to open mic. Really it's, you just, they just come. They didn't charge them necessarily. Right. So it's, but obviously when you come, you're expected to buy something. My dog is sticking her nose in the door. Uh, you're expected to buy something, but it's not like a cover charge. Now, maybe that's happened along the way, but hey, people thought I was funny. It's pretty damn funny, Jack. Hey, glad I came. So it was a win-win. Okay. So you were doing that then, most of your professional career, where you're also selling, you're doing these gigs at, at night as well. Uh, recently, you're no longer working in sales. Is that correct? That's right. I'm, you know, I've gotten, a, I mean, at some point you're going to, it's time to quote retire. And that's kind of did that last year. All right. So retired is a bad word for me. I just, I look at that as, you know, sitting on that ass on the couch. And that's not <laughs> me. That is, if you know anything about me, that is not me. I mean, I just got finished, uh, I was the assistant baseball coach here in Ashwood, AC Reynolds, which oh, out cool. Fairview way. So, you know, uh, I've got a job or two that I do. I volunteer. Uh, I do this comedy thing, some teaching these classes. And so, man, I'm, I am, uh, and my wife and I are getting into more into traveling. She's re retired from her. She owned a marketing agency. She retired from that a year or so ago. So life shifts uh, and kind of doing a different thing now, trying to figure that part of it out. Well, you'll like uh, what my job title was when I retired. I used this for a while, put it on my business card. I called myself a rewirement expert in training. You know, so I, I, re what I'm re sorry. rewirement. So it's not retirement, rewirement, you know. Yeah. And there's a great book on 
on that title along those lines. That's what I tried to do. Instead of retire, I rewired. And one of the things I got into, and we'll segue into one of the other things you're doing, one of the many things you're doing, is that I got into volunteering for Asheville Score. And I understand somehow you got hooked into that as well. And we'll use that as an entree to one of the things you're upcoming is you're now doing some teaching. And what was the idea behind now you're doing some teaching of comedy? Is that correct? That's correct. I'm doing it. I do a stand up comedy class um, and it's about an hour long and a half long. And what we're doing in this particular case with score is coming up a week from the day. And it's uh, I'm going to teach my class and then we're going to follow it up. Mike Truffa is going to close it with 30 minutes of, OK, business folks, here's what we just heard. How do you think you might could apply that to your business world? So it's kind of a fusion of those two things. But I did not want to kind of water mine down. Mike, where I talked originally of, you know, working the business thing throughout the comedy. I just not just going to do the pure comedy thing and people going to learn from that. OK. And then do you see any way to apply that? So it's uh, that's what the class is. And I'm looking forward to teaching it. Well, let's put you on the spot a little bit back to your sales uh, days that were you able to use comedy in, in your sale in your selling? Totally. Totally. So? And that's, and that's what, um, I think that's what I hope people get away from that. Now, you know, these people come to class, they may not give a damn about being a stand up comedian. They don't, they can't, there's only one Jerry Seinfeld around. Okay. So, but the, the skills that you learn, let me say this, uh, and you, you're in marketing, you've been in sales, marketing, same kind of thing. When you, uh, what's that guy's name? Jerry, Jeffrey Gittimer, who wrote a lot okay, of sales. Yeah, right. Little Red Sales sure. Bible. He spends a whole chapter on comedy, or excuse me, humor and laughter in sales. And he uses a line that if you can make them laugh, they'll buy from you. That's a little harsh to me. I don't say that, but it does. That, in essence, what happened. Comedy, humor, laughter, when you share a laugh with somebody, it it brings it magic happens and a bonding occurs that just happens. Now, I did a lot, a lot of cold calling in my day. Believe me, you got to you got to be on your toes when you go knock on a door. And if you're this button down, blah, 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 come in there, particularly in the south. And I'm sure it's true up north. They'll say hit the road. <laughs> However, I mean, I know I don't knock on the door. Hey, have you heard the one about you don't do a stand up routine, but you use your on the fly up here to to break the ice. And there is no better way to do it than comedy. And if somebody can prove me wrong, have at it because I have seen it work. Well, let me put you on the spot um, as an example. So you're making a cold call. And like I said, you don't want to start off with a joke per se, but can you give an example of where you used humor or joke you ever used in terms of making a cold call? Not off the top of my head, but but blame what, what you do as a salesperson, whatever. I mean, you're aware of your surroundings. I mean, I look behind you and you got Blaine's world. I love that Blaine's world. I'm a big Garth and Wayne's, Wayne's world right, fan right. anyway. Okay. <laughs> if I called on you, I would be looking at that and have something – you know, where's Garth, Blaine? You know, something <laughs> like that. Something that you see when you walk in that's relevant to the moment. And it may, again, you're not there to do a stand-up routine because they don't give a crap about, right. they don't give a crap about you really to start with. But you've got to do something real quick to get some attention. And I'm going to find something in there or what somebody's wearing or some something where I can interject a moment of levity if at all possible. Well, it's too bad I know you at the time, Jack, but I'll share the one thing I would tell in my marketing sales seminars about cold calling. And you're right, it's the toughest thing in the world to do to make cold calls. So I would tell people, Jack, most people don't realize this, that if you ever, you probably got the, you once got a list of 100 names to cold call. Have you gotten those kinds of lists or you've seen those I lists? Make, yeah, I'd make those lists. Oh, right. yeah. So I would tell people, Jack, if you, next time you get a list, don't start at the beginning, start at the letter Z. You know, because everybody, you know, the routine that they started sales calls, uh, cold calls, and it lasts maybe three weeks and they quit, you know. So the guy Zuckerman has never yeah. gotten a call in his life, you know. So if you yeah. visit him 
you'll be the first one to have a he'll buy whatever you're selling you know that's right mr mr aardvark bought (laughs) mr aardvark's heard it too long right exactly so that's a little technique i tell folks but it kind of works and and like you're saying and i'll try to do it in teaching or seminars if you have some fun with it or make people smile you're halfway there at least you know exactly there's, there's kind of a cool thing and let's segue that then a little bit into this really cool seminar you're doing for Asheville Score. I feel bad because we'll mention it. We'll give contact information. But we'll tell people it's already sold out, you know, uh, so they can try to get on our waiting list. But talk about what you're doing for the uh, Asheville Score. I believe it's next week. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, and I've talked to Mike about this. And so, you know, I was excited to hear that there's, you know, pretty good demand for this thing. I said, well, hey, Mike, we can do it again. So it looks like we might have one in the fall. Hopefully, you know, I want to get some feedback to see how we're doing, but uh, after we do this thing, but I feel pretty confident that it's going to be a good thing. So in the fall, Blaine, I want to shift gears just a second to answer sure. your question. Um, how my how I developed this uh, stand up comedy class. OK, so uh, back uh, back flash to Nashville when I lived there, I was trying to find uh airtime stage time wherever in nashville now it's kind of tough so i was trying to create my own so i went to uh, a place called room at the end which handles deals with the homeless population in, in nashville they've got like a prototype how to deal with the homeless situation it's it's incredible they got a network of 200 churches they have a beautiful facility downtown well i went to them and thinking well hey man ask them if they had a stage or something i could come in and do comedy from time to time they said, well, they just said, have you, how about you teach a class here on stand up? And I said, what? And they said, teach it. Why don't you teach a class? We do creative teaching, creative courses, stand up would fit in there. And so I thought, well, hey, what the heck? So uh, six and a half years later, I, I kind of shut it down to move on to something else. But so I taught my stand up class to the homeless for about six and a half years. And I condensed it down to a tight basics of stand up, and I'd get, teach them how to find funny, how to write a joke and how to perform. That's in, that's what this class is come up with score. And then they would perform at the end and get voted on by their peers. Uh, who's funniest, who's second funniest, give them a gift card and we all go our merry way. But it, it was quite an incredible experience. And so all of that is a tough room, I might add. All of that, <laughs> all of that builds to my experience with this class that we're about to do. It's very interactive, very, I'm gonna flap my gums a little bit, but not too much. It's gonna be about, you know, putting in some uh your ideas, put them into paper and and performing them. Well, let me ask you this since you're talking about it. In terms of learning stand-up, is that something that can be learned? People can pick it up? That's a great question, man. Okay, so you let me drop back to Seinfeld. Okay, I've never was a Seinfeld fan. Uh, the whole New York thing and whatever, I just didn't care. You know, I just, the whole thing. I started watching this thing called Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee by Jerry sure. Seinfeld on Crackle. It was, you know, two or three, four years ago. I became a fan of Jerry Seinfeld then. Okay, I, when it shifted off a of crackle and went to some, you know, streaming thing, I, I lost touch with that. Anyway, uh, I was going to share this with you, but they have done a book. Right. Where they, Seinfeld, the comedian in cars getting coffee book. This thing right here. If you, have you ever watched there, have you ever watched that blind? I've watched the show. I haven't read the yeah. book. The book is just a, is all these interviews. It's tremendous. It's a wealth of resource. That's a long-winded way to get to this. His interview with Steve Harvey, I thought was, you know, they're sitting smoking cigars and drinking cognac. <laughs> and Harvey, they asked that question to each other. Do you think you can teach stand-up? Seinfeld says, no, nah, you can't teach people how to do stand-up. And Harvey kind of agreed with him. And I get what they're saying in that you've either, you, you have got to be able to see, you've got to have a, I don't know, a personality or ability to see things in a different way first off and then you you know work on it feel figure out how to take it to stage and be funny with it i and i think you can teach people 
the essence of stand up and what it is. And it's, you've got to figure it out yourself. In my hour and a half class, am I going to teach somebody to be Seinfeld? <laughs> no, I'm not. I, I'm not. Let's lower the bar here. I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to teach you some basics and you're going to get a chance to perform and maybe fail or succeed in that class. But you're going to have to, you're going to have to figure this out yourself, man. You may be in a natural and you can see it. And I've, I've Blaine, I have I have performed stand-up. I have also studied stand-up. I have read a lot. I have seen the great ones. I actually know something about this stuff. And it is all about finding your comic voice. And there's and so many times people just say, say, well, damn, you're funny, man. You ought to do an open mic. Well, they do, they blow it up, and the next thing you know, you know, they're on uh, Jimmy Fallon. I mean, now that's you got to have talent to do that, but that's an easy question. You know, can it, a class teach you? I think it can put you put you on your way and maybe help you say, yeah, I kind of like this stuff. Uh, well, and somebody, and I, yeah, I, I think I think you gave kind of a good example of it too, using your own experience, is that you can take you can do stand up, you can go to stand up at mics, whatnot. But just, I guess what I'm taking away from this and hearing from you is that you just have to do it kind of the more you do it also in your daily life or every day you were mentioning sales or whatever you do. Wouldn't it be cool if you could just bring some humor into it? Yeah. And that's, and that's, you know, just cause I don't do stand up now, go down to Greenville and do shows there. It doesn't mean that I don't want to be funny when I go out to go to Ingalls this morning, you know, I'm going to be me and bring some light to the moment. My daddy used to use the expression. He said, son, bring something to the party. He said, don't be like a stale jar of pee or <laughs> piss better. Don't be. And, and you understand, I mean, that's what, when I come, when I, you know, when I'm me, I just, a lot of people bore me, man. I just, I'm sorry, but you know, they just give me some juice, man. And and so I'm the kind of guy that I don't know. I just have to bring that juice. It's just what I do. You know, well, I'll, I'll give you a compliment. And that's just, you have me laughing, you know, just in this discussion here. I think that's, that's the key. Um, if you get people laughing, you're halfway there, whatever you, you're doing. Right. Talk, talk about the, the back to the course. then. so I have it in front of me. For the benefit of people interested, and we're going to have them check it out, it's going to be on June 8th, uh, upcoming at 4 p.m. at Lenore Ryan University in Montford, or I guess it's on Montford Avenue in Asheville. It's in the, it's, yeah, it's in the Asheville right. Chamber right. Building. The Chamber Building. And again, if I have it in front of me, if people want more information about this, if they're lucky to get signed up for it, it's um, uh, score.org, www.score.org slash Asheville. And they'll get information about it. But as you mentioned, or we mentioned before, it's kind of sold out, but you can get on a waiting list. I, yeah, yeah I'd say, excuse me, let me interject. I'd say go on and jump on there, man, and get on the wait list. You know how these things go. People sign up. It's free. And, right. and when it's free, it's for me. I mean, people say, you know, they, you get no shows. There's no financial commitment. So who knows? You may sign up today. Yeah, so and so we had three to drop out. Your slot opens up, and you know, right place, right time. You you don't get anywhere unless you you know try. And if I put us uh, kind of on the spot again, um, if they come to this workshop on the eighth, um, kind of a Reader's Digest version of what to expect from it. What are they going to get out of it? Okay, good question. I mean, my class focuses on three things: one, what is funny, and how do you find it; two, how to write a joke. And three performance. That's the that's the structure of the class. Over all my years of everything distilled down, it's like the sediment in the bottom of a test tube, a centrifuge. It's going to be. I'm going to hit you with both barrels on that. But also, you're going to. I'm going to teach you how to three different techniques for writing a joke. We're going to discuss in depth how to find funny and and backing up a step. I want to try to open people's minds into how to look for funny, how to, how to get out of your own head and look at things differently. I mean, I can find something funny to funeral, you know, <laughs> and it's just, again, that's kind of back to your question. Can you teach stand up? I can't teach everybody how to find something funny at a funeral. 
It's just how I'm wired. However, I think I can teach people that look at things in a different way. And then that's your material. Uh, your find your comic voice, write the joke, and then get up on stage and give it a go. It's pretty much that. And yeah, so. Let me ask you ahead, this. Sorry. Something that's bothering me a little bit, though, that when you're trying to be funny and either funny on stage or in work, where I try to be funny on Facebook and you get a, um, most people like it, but what happens when you get people who don't like something you say or, or worse now it's big issue now if they find offensive in it, how do you deal with that? Great question. I mean, uh, I was putting together, I'm hoping by the bys, I'm hoping I put a proposal into AB tech. I hope I can, can, um, uh, get this class going. It's we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that happened in the fall, maybe whatever kind of the balls in their court. But uh, one of the things I thought about as I was putting together my kind of a comprehensive outline is what happens when you hear crickets, what do you do? <laughs> crickets is, you know, when, when the, you told what you thought, damn, that's funny. And there's silence in the room. Okay. <laughs> And you learn how to deal with that. But there are techniques where you flip the switch on that and then you make it, you know, it goes in self-deprecating mode, if you will. And then you, all of a sudden you're making fun of yourself and get that laugh going again and get that momentum going. So there is, it's a skill. It's, it's a practice skill and it's a great skill to have, particularly back to that sales thing. I mean, when you get, when people look at you like, you know, a cow looking at a new gate. I mean, you know, they just, <laughs> then you're, you've got to react to that. Now on the offensive side, that's a little bit different arena there. I mean, I tell people in my class, I mean, man, you, you say whatever you want to, but just because you think it's funny and, and people need to hear it, that doesn't mean that you're not going to piss some people off. And if you do, you got to live with it. I mean, Tracy Lawrence, uh, you know, he stepped into the, the gay arena or whatever, I forget what he was, man. He had to, some serious backpedaling and whatnot about that. And I mean, I don't do offensive stuff. I mean, I understand. I've been around. I know what is not right to do and I'm not going to do it. So I try, you're not perfect, but if you put yourself in a position for that, don't be surprised if people get pissed off. And I, that's not, that's not who I am, man. I mean, hey, I'm no Don Rickles. I mean, he made a career of that. He kind of he kind of invented that stuff. And he made a career of it. But it ain't me. And again, it's back to comic voice thing. The line I'm using now when, when people object to something I, I I write typically, I use a Mark Twain line. I have it in front of me here. It's it's not best that we should all think alike. It is a difference of opinion that makes horse races, you know. And so yeah, I realize that. But upset, it still upsets me when if I offend anybody, you know, I don't want to, like you said, you don't want to do it intentionally. But nowadays, somebody's going to get offended about almost anything you do, you know. That's true. So, um, it's and it's, not, a, yeah, it's a, you know, I mean, we all live in this world. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nitpicky world. I mean, and Lord knows with social media now, I mean, it's everywhere. And so, uh, Things can get blown out of proportion, but if they start off wrong, you can very well bet they're going to be blown out of, or they're going to be blown up. If folks want to keep track of Jack Lunn, again, we're inviting them to go to the seminar at SCORE, uh, www.score.org slash Asheville. But aside from this seminar, what's the best way people can track you down or find out about some of the stuff you're doing? Uh, you know, that's... Good question, Blaine. I am not active on Facebook. I just, it's its not really my thing. I mean, I've got, I, I look at it on rare occasion. I mean, I guess that's one way to do it. Facebook, Jack Lunn, L-U-N-N. -N. Uh, LinkedIn, I used to be in the business world. I was highly involved in that. I wrote right. a lot of articles and tried to do some funny stuff on that. So that may be a good way. LinkedIn, LinkedIn. Jack okay. Lunn. You know, that's kind of more of a business thing, but that's what I, that's okay. the route I went for my packaging sales was that, but it wasn't just about boring people to tears with, you know, the latest cardboard to use or whatever it was. I tried to put some humor in there. So there's, there's actually a couple of, a couple of, of funny things on that, I guess. I guess, as you mentioned earlier, they can also go to your hometown 
and they'll see the Jack Lundholm or something or what? No, they won't <laughs> see that. Well, down they'll the... see it. They'll see it if they look <laughs> through the weed. Down the road or right next to Haley's house, we'll we'll we'll, we'll something for yeah. you, Jack. Anyway, right. I'd like I'd like thank you for being my guest on this uh, issue of the Blaine's World podcast. Hope to see you on um on the eighth. And uh, I'd also thank my producer, Cappy Tassetti, and we'll see you sometime, hopefully in the near future, Jack. You be well. Thank you, Blaine. Appreciate it.